Thank you. So everybody always butchers my name. It's OK. It's Doss Kamhout. <laughs> it's a strange name. Um, so uh, I, I'm the guy who actually lives all the nightmare that Dave was talking about. Um, <clears throat> my background's in grid computing. So uh, I, I operated and engineered uh, the environment that we run inside of Intel for grid, which has a, a pretty massive data gravity problem. Um, and then for the last three years, I've been focused on uh, basically driving and uh, strategy and execution for what we do for cloud for traditional IT. So in the grid computing environment, we, uh, we're very, very uh, uh, standardized, but uh, lots, of, uh, lots of entropy. Meanwhile, in traditional IT, it's exactly what, uh, what Dave was talking about. So that was uh, refreshing to see. So I'm going to uh, basically talk about our, our journey, um, what we've done, where we're at, uh, and give you a little bit of background on, on what we're doing with cloud, um, and also just a little bit about uh, what an enterprise IT shop uh, kind of looks like. But, but first of all, you know, my philosophy, which kind of helps dictate you know, some of the things that we do uh, inside of uh, Intel IT for, for cloud and other areas. So, so first of all, uh, my perspective is open is our future. Uh, if you look at something like Linux, um, which, uh, you know, until we were, we were uh, strong proponents of this. We used to even design our chips on, uh, on Unix systems and RISC processors. Uh, we drove Linux pretty heavily. And you saw that Linux and, and the hypervisors in, on the open source space really led to the creation of many public cloud services. So you see this, this constant cycle of, of new innovations, innovations going open, another new innovation, more open source. Um, after, you know, many of these public cloud services uh, came into existence, we started seeing concepts of, of open clouds. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, we could potentially see more federation of clouds where things are connected uh, more and more together and more disruption, more innovation happening. Don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, open farming, but uh, I, I'm seriously a big proponent on open, openness. So open farming, open robots, all these things exist today. Um, and it's pretty encouraging, you know, that we will get to, you know, Star Trek in the not too distant future, thanks to the innovations of all of you. Um, the next philosophy I have is uh, computers should work for me. Um, I don't want to work for computers. Uh, most enterprise IT shops, um, you know, it's, it's pretty much the opposite. So one of our goals with things like cloud is how do we shift that around? And we've had a lot of progress uh, you know, since 2400 BC with Abacus to uh, you know, punch cards and to where we are now, where we have 3D trigate transistors that uh, are extremely, extremely small. I can't remember how many fit on a single hair, but it's, it's pretty high. And, and pretty amazing concepts going on in regards to innovation. Really, computers should work uh, for me. And then, uh, you know, there's two ways to look at this next philosophy, which is either I constantly engineer myself out of a job or constantly engineer myself up the stack. So um, the, the thing about enterprise IT is, is there's always more work to do, and we usually actually don't have enough headcount to get it done. So things like big data um, or driving insights out of data is, uh, is a great thing, but usually we starve some of those projects or, or put very small teams on them because so many people are working on, on basic things then they have not engineered themselves up the stack. Um, another thing I just want to quickly share before we dive into is, is my wish list. Uh, this is something, uh, I think we, I sent it out you know, early 2011. Uh, first it was just something to our internal team. Hey, can you guys uh, you know, actually make this happen? Um, a lot of these things are, are similar to how we run in a grid space. Uh, but in a traditional IT space, they're not there. Uh, we see both infrastructure as a service and platform as a service helping uh, achieve these, but um, I, I'm not going to go through all the details, but, but fundamentally, uh, uh, we're really not there in the industry, or very few people are actually doing all these things. So there, there's great uh, aspirations that I think we all have uh, to truly move to uh, completely autonomic environments where the computers really do work for us, uh, where everything is deployed as a resilient service, um, where you can actually run at global scale, you know, not just in the United States, uh, with resilient services, where things like security is actually part of deployment uh, through automation, and, and everything is accessible through, uh, uh, from machine perspective uh, as services, and preferably uh, open APIs. So uh, just a little bit about Intel IT. So uh, we're an interesting shop because uh, we cover a pretty broad spectrum of, of customers internally, everything from uh, the product development and engineering side of the house, which is you know, where my background was, um, to manufacturing, which has very specific characteristics of what it needs, um, into the more traditional areas that most IT shops have, like sales and marketing, finance and HR, uh, supply chain. Um, so our job is we have to cover basically this broad spectrum of stakeholders and figure out how to build solutions 
that are as horizontal as possible and enable all these different types of business units. Um, and so our, our focus area is uh, first uh, consumerization. Uh, to us, this is uh, you know, pretty straightforward. You can, you can get software now that doesn't require you to take a training class. Right? That, that's kind of uh, cutting edge for most IT shops. Um, but the shift to, uh, to personal devices and software that's, uh, that's built for consumers is, is a change that IT shops are going up upon. Uh, cloud computing, which I'll talk about, uh, core security, business intelligence, and social computing. So our, our CIO basically tracks uh, these five areas, and, and we set strategic goals um, and specific targets that we have to do across all of them. And they're all uh, very closely interrelated. And just a little bit about our, our statistics. So we're about 6,500 employees um, in, in IT, so a fairly large IT shop. But recall that it covers you know, all those areas from development to uh, traditional uh, IT environments. About 95,000 employees across the world, 68 data centers, uh, so quite a few data centers. Um, but a lot of these are actually fairly small. Uh, we probably have about 70,000 servers today, um, so fairly large for an enterprise shop. Uh, highly virtualized in our traditional IT and no virtualization whatsoever in our design grid. Um, we support quite a few devices, obviously more than employees. And uh, that's actually my cloud security guy who uh, is the bane of my existence. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, maturity model of where, where we see things going uh, in regards to cloud. So, so on the far left, you see uh, my, my consumer. So my first consumer was IT ops. So IT ops has a, a very complex environment because nothing is, uh, everything is specialized, and, and the systems that they use to manage it um, are not very automated. So the first thing we did is, is standardize uh, the environments from a compute storage and network perspective and expose that as, as simple compute infrastructure as a service. This was then given out to the next set of consumers, which are the app owners and app developers. These were our real target uh, for cloud from the perspective of giving them the ability to get what they want when they need it um, on demand. And then the different color coding on the top for my end user is, is really, really who I care about personally. Uh, we have 95,000 employees inside of Intel. Our Intel uh, overall goal is to enrich the lives of everybody on Earth. My job is to least enrich the lives of everybody inside of Intel. So that means as an end user, you should be able to get to your apps and data anywhere, anytime, through any device. It sounds trivial, uh, but it's actually quite complex when you deal with the enterprise shop, um, especially with lots of firewalls, legacy software, things that weren't really built uh, for this new model where, where people expect you know, to be always connected, always on, and always able to access their data. Um, so this, this maturity model uh, is used by the Open Data Center Alliance, but it basically articulates some steps that we've actually seen every enterprise IT shop is on. Uh, they're on different stages of the, st of the, of the maturity model, but uh, pretty much everyone that I've talked to is following this path of, hey, I'm first going to look at my traditional applications. And traditional apps are basically you know, the opposite of cloud aware. They do not scale out. Uh, they have no concept of design for failure, uh, and they're purely built uh, in the very traditional uh, ways, uh, almost more like uh, what you'd see in a mainframe, but moved to a client server. As we move down the path, we start uh, introducing enterprises to cloud-aware concepts, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that, but a lot was covered earlier by, by Dave. Um, as we move forward, we start to going from simple SaaS solutions to complex SaaS, um, so where we really start utilizing uh, uh, versus something simple as, as getting like expense reports or, or travel uh, through a SaaS provider or uh, maybe basic uh, sales tools through a SaaS provider to more complex SaaS where you start doing B2B um, and, and more advanced uh, 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 capabilities actually in the public SaaS arena. Uh, for us, our focus is heavily on, on private, uh, meaning we've, uh, we've chosen to do a uh, majority of our environment as, as a private cloud. Uh, this is predominantly based on um, what we believe is our economies of scale. Uh, we basically look at three factors, total cost, uh, security, and performance. And uh, at least up until this point, into the foreseeable, foreseeable future, uh, we believe uh, for, for large-scale companies, you will have a, a, some form of, of private offering. Um, the point of those, those blue boxes, though, is, is everything's connected. Uh, so one thing Dave talked about was uh, the reality of the world where services connect to services that connect to services. Um, and if you look at any of the, the ways that we traditionally look at even things like application performance management, uh, the complexity that we're moving in is, uh, is pretty high. From the, you, know, you have things running on-premise. Uh, they connect to a SaaS provider or a, a service 
a provider outside of your firewall. They connect to somebody else, and you start really seeing this long uh, line of latency um, that's quite problematic. But, but our goal is to continue to advance uh, the interoperability that's required to go between uh, the various layers of our services, uh, whether it's external or internal, um, to us should become irrelevant. Uh, where we'd like to be is uh, a couple of phases down the road uh, is this you know, federated, interoperable, and open cloud. Uh, people say I'm silly for putting 2014 up there, but we're already seeing the signs uh, that this is being enabled. Um, there's quite a few people that are uh, trying to push this direction of going from proprietary clouds to, to open clouds, and we think this is good uh, for the future of innovation uh, in the industry. Um, so when I look at our, our Intel IT cloud future, what we want is, is lots of reusable services. Uh, you know, I think some company coined the, turn the data center into software. Uh, for us, it's, it's, it's even more than that. So fundamentally, if you look at every layer of the stack as a set of services uh, that can build upon each other, these should be enabled to how do I make it easier for my end user uh, to have this uh, you know, enriched experience. So fundamentally at the bottom, from an infrastructure perspective, I need my storage computer network, you know, basic infrastructure as a service, to be exposed as APIs uh, that I can build, a build upon. I need my application platform services to be able to uh, rely on those underneath them, but designed for failure. Above that, I have a wide set of app services that people will mash up together to make these uh, amazing new applications. Um, we've, we've gone through a few phases of, uh, obviously these boxes aren't uh, perfect, things will change over time. But uh, we've gone through a few scenarios where it just make it really easy uh, for our application developers to think in this model, and they can come up with, with apps quickly. Uh, and and it, it happens uh, very quick, and I'll show you some examples of some internal codathons that we do um, to get people thinking about these reusable services. Everything's composable. Everything is going to be utilizing each other um, uh, inside of the, the cloud environment. From a, from a cloud strategic direction, uh, we, we really have three points that we focus on. One is what I talked about earlier. Uh, make, make the necessary changes to make it uh, easy uh, to expose the apps and data uh, to improve our end user productivity. So this is just fundamental for us. Um, I, I don't work because uh, uh, IT is just fun. I'm working because I'm trying to uh, make it easier and easier for uh, Intel employees uh, to be more productive so they can get uh, more done. The second is drive the transformation to a large scale automated hybrid cloud infrastructure. Um, if you go inside an enterprise IT shop today, uh, the vast majority are not automated. Uh, there's lots of people clicking on, on GUIs. Uh, they've become very, very accustomed to this working model. Um, and we fundamentally, be fundamentally believe that this has to shift drastically uh, to completely automated, uh, to completely standardized, with the capability to uh, do specialized systems uh, throughout your stack. And, and the third point is, is we also care a lot about the, the industry moving. Um, we, were, uh, we were heavy involved in, in moving the industry towards Linux uh, for certain uh, segments, and we believe enterprise IT needs to move faster uh, to embrace cloud principles. Um, the time is now. Uh, some people are moving too slow, in our opinion, uh, and we would like to help you know, accelerate that transformation. So, so myself and some of my peers, uh, we spend a lot of time with our, our peers in the industry helping to figure out how to move, uh, whether it's private, whether it's public, how to help people make that transformation from traditional legacy IT uh, to really where we need to be now uh, with cloud computing. Uh, some of our, our tactical goals, um, utilization. So we do a lot of things uh, for, for cost reasons. Um, and fundamentally, utilization is a, is a pretty standard metric that we utilize. Uh, just for comparison, our grid environment runs at 80% utilization across the globe. This is probably about 60,000 servers. So that's, a, that's pretty hot compared to most environments. Uh, contrast that to a traditional IT shop, um, even ours before we started doing a private cloud, is about 8%. So 8% utilized versus 80% utilized. When you're 8% utilized, you have a lot of waste. Right? So how do you uh, basically increase your utilization um, to the level of risk that's tolerable to you uh, in order to drive up that, that capital asset um, or even if you're doing operating expense, how do you make sure your allocation uh, and your consumption are as close to possible? The next point is just constant velocity increase. Uh, for us, on-demand self-service has, has been the norm um, since about 2010 for our traditional IT. In grid computing, um, on-demand has just been the norm for, for ages. People submit jobs by themselves, no interaction with IT. We basically want to make IT as invisible as possible um, and really have IT only focus on the toughest challenges versus you know, just uh, uh, taking server requests. 
Um, and from a past perspective, one thing we're really intrigued by is a concept, uh, just how do we get an idea into production in less than a day? Um, so you, you need a lot of things to make that happen, but one of those is, is platform as a service, meaning the ability to quickly uh, get your code um, written to the platform and, and launched immediately. But the concept of composable services, meaning I have many others that have built services that I can then mash up together and, and quickly turn those on. So we really want people to have these idea to production less than a day. What it encourage us uh, to do is to basically fail faster. So the more ideas that get out um, and the faster the bad ones fail, uh, the more uh, quickly we can move along in the innovation path. And the third point is zero business impact. If you talk to most IT shops, uh, including our own, um, the concept of downtime is very, very normal. Uh, but how many of you uh, expect downtime when you're dealing with uh, your social apps? Or how many on Twitter would you like if they sent you a note saying it's down for the next two hours? It would, uh, it would be pretty lame. Um, and in, inside of IT shops, uh, that's, that's actually fairly normal. Weekend downtimes, five hours, six hours, where things just shut down. It's not everything, but you know, key services go down. Our intent is zero business impact, uh, so all apps get designed for failure. That doesn't mean we don't turn off data centers or have electrical upgrades. It just means that the applications are built for resilience. They understand the concepts of, of multi-region. They understand the concept of how to work at, at a global scale. And in some scenarios, they get very advanced and, and do, do things like Paxos, which uh, and, and, and certain causal consistency and ventral consistency methods uh, to ensure they always stay up. Uh, so just uh, you know, where we're at right now, uh, we, we chose in our traditional IT space to be uh, highly virtualized. Um, it works well for a lot of the workloads we have in traditional IT. 80% um, of all of our new servers uh, go in our private cloud, and what that means is, is IT is no longer uh, the bottleneck for most server acquisitions. Um, it's, we feel it's, it's fairly high for an enterprise IT shop, but, but fundamentally what used to be there was a long level of bureaucracy and process. We had engagement managers. Uh, to order one server, you had to talk to uh, an engagement manager. They checked your request. They saw if it was valid. Um, and eventually what we found is they always said yes, too. So we just remove that whole process and everybody just acquires what they need uh, when they need it. Um, our goal and where we're going is uh, we want land, you know, servers are great, but landing apps in minutes is, is more important. Um, we want fully functioning environments landed uh, immediately. And uh, we've been investing quite a bit in platforms of service over the last uh, year and a half or so, and uh, as well as our direction to uh, what we call our open cloud, which is based predominantly on open source. So uh, just, just real quickly to give a perspective on, on financials, um, since money does matter. Uh, when we looked at, at private cloud, if we did not do it, uh, our, our cost for this traditional IT environment would be about 30 million TCO. Um, doing uh, our, our private cloud environment has taken us to 15 million, so approximately you know, 14 million lower TCO over a four year uh, NPV. Um, the key thing about this stat is it doesn't actually include the automation benefits um, so uh, one thing we don't usually do in most uh, finance groups is include soft costs. So it's not like we're going to uh, lay off all the people that we, we move them to new jobs. So fundamentally, our, our bottom line costs are still the same uh, from a headcount perspective. But the automation gains in regards to velocity, allowing our software developers to get what they want when they need it, uh, has been a pretty, pretty impressive. Um, but there's this uh, a new baseline has been set um, of efficiency. So. Uh, uh, today, it's, it's about 10%, 10 cents uh, per VM hour uh, from infrastructure as a service perspective, and this drops uh, every, every quarter almost. Um, so we're in an interesting state, and I, I think this year is going to be pretty intriguing um, as the uh, public cloud providers really start uh, competing with each other. Um, as we know, this, this cost is probably from one specific public cloud provider, but as the war begins on pricing, you know, how low can we go in regards to cost to do computing? Um, will it get to one cent per VM hour? Uh, will it get to half a cent? Um, how, how low will we go? And then the question that I often ask one of my, most of my enterprise IT peers is, how expensive are you? And can you actually look at a, at a VM per unit cost and do any calculation to determine whether or not your environment uh, you know, can actually compete with what's happening uh, in the very large scale uh, public clouds today? So, it's an interesting time from IT. You know, lots of uh, uh, advances in private cloud, but you know, this, this baseline of efficiency and the point that it's going to continue to drop um, uh, causes some interesting perspectives. 
So I want to jump into our, our past. What, what have we done there? Um, so we, uh, we basically uh, we, we made a pitch to our CIO staff um, in 2000, uh, probably early 2011. Um, at that point in time, it was really difficult for anybody to have any concept in an IT shop of what PaaS was. Uh, we spent an hour uh, basically educating our IT staff that this is what platform as a service is, this is our target market uh, inside of IT, and this is what we can use it for. Um, so some of the basic points is first, you know, realize um, and then articulate the problem. So I think it's, it's fundamental for an IT shop to, one, recognize they have an issue uh, and then work around it. So we had a 70-day new app landing. Uh, our goal was uh, under a day. So 70 days is basically all the process um, and, and checkpoints and meetings that have to happen to, to release an app. And this is actually fairly normal uh, in most uh, enterprise IT shops. And so we said, hey, look, you know, 70 days is way too slow. It doesn't make any sense. We like the idea of uh, uh, continuous uh, improvement. We want to be able to let our people you know, roll out code every single day, every hour if they want to. We want them to be able to work in a DevOps model where they actually control their code. All these concepts, by the way, are, are extremely foreign to most IT shops and actually often against policy. So you know, we had to paint this picture of what was possible so we can attack the various policies. Um, we then looked at, you know, determined the potential reach and scope. So uh, inside of Intel, there's lots of software developers. Right, we have uh, everything from uh, guys that write firmware um, to people that are writing uh, web apps. So, so obviously, we didn't focus platforms of service on people writing firmware, because uh, at least as far as I can tell, there's, there's no value to them. But we looked at our, our, our growing environment of web developers, um, people that really wanted to build you know, scalable solutions uh, quickly that were able to you know, focus on productivity solutions. Uh, we then had to uh, you know, find and implement the solution. So we actually tried a couple products. Um, I'm not speaking about any of the products that we tried um, or what we use today. But we wanted to uh, define one as quickly as possible, but not too quick. And the reason not too quick is we felt in 2011 uh, the past ecosystem was actually fairly young. Um, and I'd even say today uh, there's not really a whole lot. Of, I, I don't need standards to make a choice, but I'd like some sense of interoperability uh, with a few products so that uh, my software developers are not locked in to a specific solution. Uh, one of the most expensive things for an uh, IT shop to embark on is, is the switch from one product to another. So the least lock-in possible is, is preferable to us. So we chose a product as quickly as possible, but not too quick. Um, a big point, uh, you know, a lot of people in, in cloud talk about technology, uh, but in reality, um, the workforce is the, the toughest nut to crack and to actually change. So our, our focus has been on you know, teach, get the word out as much as possible, help people with semantics, understand that their job is not uh, actually at risk. Uh, there's actually new options for them to move up the stack, uh, to do things that are more progressive uh, and more interesting, um, and get them hands-on. So we actually have a whole effort uh, inside of Intel IT on workforce transformation. We actually started with a fairly small knit group to, to drive cloud. Um, Believe it or not, uh, uh, many people inside of an IT shop, and especially our, our own, I think everyone I talk to, actually fear the change uh, that something like cloud computing brings. It, it challenges their, their roles, their jobs, um, and, and really automation just in general is, uh, is a tough thing to get around. So uh, another thing that we, we paint the picture on is, hey, there's this uh, traditional IT and then there's this cloudware IT. We have the young kids coming in uh, that are very, very familiar with uh, new coding practices. Um, and then we have software developers that are, you know, understanding more and more uh, what's possible in regards to uh, utilization of CloudAware. So just to give you a little bit of perspective, if we look at uh, velocity, uh, inside of traditional IT, uh, my first goal that I set for the team uh, was under three hours uh, for acquiring a server. And uh, in our first uh, get-togethers with our ops team, they said, why not three days? You know, we're at 24 days right now. Why would you possibly tell us to get to under three hours? Three days sounds like a good you know, medium. But uh, we, we pushed this forward, and then even one hour was like, why one hour? But now, if you, the reason we were doing that is because we wanted to ensure that there was no human element involved. Everything became automated. Um, if you compare this to a cloud aware a group, they expect to grow shrink 20x in hours, minutes. Right? They expect the ability to quickly release apps in days, weeks. And there's a general no patience for bureaucracy. 
Meanwhile, in traditional IT, you know, I talked about the 70-day app release, and bureaucracy is considered normal. It's, it's very normal. You expect it. Uh, people go to meetings just to talk about planning for the next meeting. Um, in lifecycle automation, uh, you know, there's, there's constant improvements, you know, reduce downtime costs, reduce ops labor time, but they're very incremental in nature. Uh, versus if you look at a cloud aware team, they expect APIs for all IT services. If you go inside a traditional enterprise IT shop and you look at even just the basics, the compute storage and network, you will find that most of those things actually don't have APIs exposed uh, to, to enable the, the, the ability for software to be built on top of it. Um, and manual is just not an option. Um, on availability, this is an interesting one because a lot of people argue and they say, hey, enterprise IT, uh, you know, moving to the cloud, it's a, it's a tough thing. How do you deal with availability? Um, I, I think most enterprise IT shops actually run at 997 Availability, and again, downtimes are expected. If you look at most cloud-aware environments, you know, four nines is a is a pretty good goal. Uh, four nines means uh, no more than 52 minutes of downtime a year. I think most of us, as consumers of, of software services, we expect things to always be on, right? It's just it's normal now. Uh, how often do you go to Google and aren't able to get your search done? Anybody ever? It's it's pretty rare, right? Or even just Facebook. I mean, you always expect to be able to get to Facebook. No matter what hour it is, you can get to it. So people are now expecting everything to be always on, which is uh, different from traditional IT. On the growth perspective, uh, usually in enterprise, you know, our data is growing pretty rapidly, but it's still pretty linear. And a lot of it is based on employee growth. How much are you growing? When you're dealing with the cloud-aware environment, uh, your consumers can grow without warning. Uh, you can scale. That's why you want to scale this 20x. And you, we're seeing this massive increase in connected devices. So I think there's something like 3 billion connected devices now. Uh, 500 million of those are just in China. And uh, we expect uh, you know, up to 15 billion devices uh, later this decade. So uh, we basically articulated this message to our CIO staff. And they said, hey, what is platform as a service? Hey, look, developers code their app and deploy it into production without IT assistance. That, that's fundamentally what it is at a very basic level. Um, it's self-service, it's on-demand, it's multi-tenant, it's metered. And uh, we've given them a common platform of abstracted middleware and infrastructure to allow them to, uh, to basically standardize uh, what they're building, um, and, but give them the flexibility that they need to use uh, various languages. So we're obviously, like most shops, we have a lot of .NET, uh, we have Java, we got people doing Python now, Ruby now. Um, but pretty much every, every gamut is there, which is why there's been so much uh, lack of standardization inside an enterprise shop, is there's so many options. But we want to offer that flexibility and offer it uh, with a common platform underneath. And uh, we also believe, I, I wouldn't say that this is actually uh, true yet today in the ecosystem, but PaaS should facilitate the creation of cloud-ready apps, meaning I want my applications to be built uh, to be you know, really cloud-enabled and and that means I want to be able to scale horizontally. I want them to be resilient services. I want them to be designed for failure. I want to be able to lose data centers and keep the service up. Um, but this is what we're, uh, we're envisioning uh, for PaaS. And it really allows us to focus on three points, agility, efficiency, and extensibility. So agility, uh, you know, we, we can all provision servers quickly, but once you provision that server, you can either have some automation to land your app code, et cetera. But we wanted to really enable this concept where people could go from idea uh, to production in, in less than a day um, through, through platforms of service. So for us, PaaS is just a, a natural extension. Uh, we run it on our infrastructure as a service environment. Uh, it utilizes the, the APIs underneath as it needs to. Um, and we found it's uh, allow us to standardize and standardize more and more. So uh, one thing we do, too, is we go out inside of our, our IT team and we, we start telling people, hey, what's different uh, with your apps now? You know, how, do, how do you want to think differently? So, so obviously, self-service. Uh, people should be able to self-service your app. If it's a service that you're building, they should be able to get entitled to utilize your API without calling you up. Um, Elastic, you should be able to you know, respond to demand, multi-tenant. You're sharing resources with other apps, which may mean that you need to have some concept of, of I.O. or how to deal with situations where your app performance uh, becomes lower than you want and, and make some shifts. Uh, you should be able to run anywhere. So our, our belief is, is this, this hybrid environment uh, where we eventually won't even call it hybrid and, and think workloads can actually move around. Uh, and be close to the data, or we chunk data up and move it closer to where we have capacity for the workloads. Um, everything should be evolvable, uh, reduce dependencies, understand backwards compatibility, 
um, so that your services can, can change and people can rely on your app. Uh, Composable is huge for us because we want people to be able to, to mash your app up to make other ideas and more innovation faster and faster and abstracted. Um, so we also give architectural guidance to our, our teams, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the codeathons we do internally. But uh, hopefully everybody's you know, really familiar in this room with these terms, but you know, everybody should be designing for failure. Uh, this is concepts we've used in grid computing for ages. Uh, it's, it's how you look at all the major cloud providers, how they run today, and many of the uh, popular uh, applications that get a lot of press on how well they've been built are usually designed for failure, and they can't accept failure, and you actively are testing for failure to ensure your, your system really works. Uh, stateless compute, uh, scale out, not up. Um, so most people, traditional IT apps uh, often scale up, and as we know, if you scale up, you always have a breakpoint, right? You always hit a ceiling. If you scale horizontally, it's close to infinite, except you have to understand, uh, you know, you potentially have app bottleneck, or you create a data bottleneck that, that disallows you from going completely infinite. Uh, understand event-driven. Uh, everything should be web services. So this is, uh, if people did SOA, um, they, they understood this shift, uh, but a lot of IT shops didn't go full bore SOA and didn't fully move to, uh, to an API-driven approach. Uh, and this is how we, we do everything API, CLI, then GUI. Uh, security, build security into your app. Uh, my desire is actually encrypt everywhere. Um, and it's surprising uh, how uncommon this still is today. We have the capabilities actually to encrypt everything um, and, and we don't do it. Uh, this is a fundamental problem with, with security in the cloud. Um, so, you know, I, I'm hoping this year we'll see more and more people uh, take the stance and understand how to truly encrypt and anonymize their data. Uh, we prefer eventual consistency. So one of the important points, and I see this with a lot of the platforms and service solutions today, is they actually don't enable, at least somebody correct me if I'm wrong uh, later, but uh, they don't enable uh, true ability to, to run it in multiple data centers, uh, multiple regions. Um, if you look at some of the really complex environments, say uh, uh, Google or, or, or Facebook, um, you'll see that, uh, how many of you are familiar with Google Spanner? A few people, um, good. So Spanner's really uh, simple but brilliant. Um, the problem with taking writes across the world is that uh, you, you, most people send those writes to one location so they minimize uh, issues with consistency. Uh, Google had this brilliant idea to put atomic clocks in all their data centers with GPS, and their time, if you know about NTP, NTP is not that perfect on time, but they've made their data centers exact in regards to time. So you can actually make a write just about anywhere, and uh, that, is the, that is the write. That's the known good write. Um, is anybody familiar with Paxos? Hey, good, a couple. Um, so Paxos is another brilliant thing, and the reason I'm bringing these up is uh, I think we actually have a, a road to go down in order to uh, really understand how to deal with data at scale across the globe. Uh, Paxos is a, a simple concept. Um, if I'm posting a picture up on Facebook, uh, I may be talking to one data center, and then I need to, I wanna set my security permissions on that same picture, I may actually be talking to another data center. But I don't wanna give that information out, right? I may have a picture of me uh, you know, at a bar that's completely inappropriate, and I wanna make sure my coworkers don't get it. So Paxos allows you to ensure that all your, your uh, data sets, um, regardless of where they are in the world, are in sync before they return back to the user. This is fundamentally how people use it. But uh, what's shocking to me still is we're not, uh, uh, we're not evolved enough yet in the software development world to be using this at scale, especially not enterprise IT shops. So you, think, you see things like Spanner and Paxos happening at the very cutting edge environments that have to work at global scale. Um, and we do believe that this is uh, something that, that most will need to move to as they enable software and solutions that actually work across the globe always on. Uh, DevOps and NoOps. Um, I brought this up briefly, but DevOps in most enterprise IT shops is against policy, meaning it's usually not okay to have a developer push their code out uh, into the environment uh, themselves. Right, so it's, it's like completely opposite of what we'd want to do for continuous improvement. By the way, how many actually uh, work in an enterprise IT shop? Okay, so I have a few. Uh, do you guys allow DevOps today? Secretly? <laughs> 
So, uh, so it, it's an interesting problem. And then um, I, I do love the concept of no ops. It's scary for IT people. But fundamentally, the way we look at no ops is make IT invisible. Um, allow the, the software developers to, to build their code, uh, build their solutions, but they should not have to call an IT person to fix a problem. IT, in many situations, on the infrastructure side, become invisible um, and really start dealing with the more complex items on, on the information side. Uh, I just want to give a, a quick example of design pattern. We actually give quite a few to our, our, our developers. Uh, this is a sample one on basic active-active. So assume your app is deployed to N plus one clouds. Um, you usually uh, want to interface with some sort of global load balancer. Obviously, there's solutions that do this uh, through DNS today. Uh, some enterprise IT shops actually have the capability. They just don't use it a lot. But the end user is basically routed to either, uh, you know, you can use all kinds of algorithms, whether it's round robin or closest proximity. Um, utilize eventual consistency and conflict resolution uh, and build that into your app. Um, data rep database replication we configure uh, behind the scenes. Uh, we actually don't do this in our past platform today. Uh, we would like to. Um, app URL is added to the GLB to actively distribute across app instances. So, so basically what this allows us to do is uh, we can lose an entire data center, um, the application stays up, uh, just things that were in, in, uh, in processing at that point in time uh, end up with an issue. Um, but we give these out to our, our developers to try more and more patterns uh, to make it easier for them to start building cloud-aware solutions. Um, one of the other things that we're doing is uh, internally to help you know, train our, our people to move forward is we've been running some Cloudaware uh, codeathons internally. So this is uh, basically uh, a one-day session, um, and we, we bring together uh, you know, usually about 40, 50 people now. Uh, usually it's a waiting list, but get them to, to land them on, on, our, on our past platform. Um, we, they compete against each other for prizes, and they're basically, they get raided at the end. But I just want to point out uh, a couple interesting things. Uh, so these all happen in one day, um, like a hackathon would, uh, but our goal is to try to show our, our developers, hey, this concept of idea to production in less than a day is totally possible um, if you just, you know, try it. Um, so uh, just some examples, uh, a banana finder. So uh, this is something just, it's crowdsourced cafe intelligence. Uh, we get free fruit at, at Intel. We don't get uh, free food, uh, but we do at least get free fruit. Um, so help you know where, you're, you're, uh, where there's an abundance of fruit uh, through crowdsource method. Someone made a, a program to create a presentation uh, in the cloud with a you know, simple ease, no, no PowerPoint, uh, no, no presentation tools, uh, just automatically creates it. Uh, someone came up with a pretty funny one, uh, Enterprise Fund, so we all know Kickstarter. But one of the problems you often have in a, in a large enterprise is, is getting something uh, sponsored and funded. So they built a multi-org crowdfunding uh, tool to basically you know, reach out and, and crowdsource and, and get funding across it. Um, how many of you uh, work at a building that has parking spot issues? OK, I'm the only one. Um, so, you know, but this is, my point is, is this is the type of uh, basic little innovations that are possible inside of an enterprise that's a fairly large scale. These aren't products that we, we can really find out on the market. There's no app for that. So these are things that people are building uh, because they say, hey, this is a problem for my end users. I'm going to build a locate a parking spot app. You know, this is something that's normal, uh, well, becoming more and more normal, like say with the new BMWs. But uh, you know, this is something that we can use and actually make it a little bit easier for people to, to get to work. Um, so just back on my wish list, uh, just want to point this out again. Uh, we would love to see, I personally would love to see uh, many of these concepts you know, become completely real. If, if anybody uh, thinks that they are today, I would love to talk to you. Um, I, I do have a blog that has all these detailed in depth. Um, and we'd love to have, a, I'd love to have a discussion on, on how we, uh, we solve some of these problems uh, in the environment. Um, so, so some closing and food for thought. Um, so the, the boundaries to progress. So I, I talked a lot about uh, you know, what IT looks like, our, our focus on cloud, uh, what we've done in the past space. Um, but some of the boundaries to progress is uh, if you go inside a large enterprise, and, and if any of you, uh, you know, sell to an enterprise or interact with the enterprise, um, realize that uh, the community for that enterprise is the company, meaning it's usually as small or large um, as the company is. This is very different from uh, the open source community. So one of the reasons we try to ingrain on our developers to get involved in the open source community is because uh, the community should be the world. 
but the boundary today is often the confines of that, that company. And this is often for legal reasons or just policy reasons, uh, and we want to help push this forward. Design patterns should be something that's shared by everybody. We should all know what Paxos is. We should all be figuring out ways to do Spanner. Uh, we should all be really pushing the envelope, um, but doing it at a very broad scale across the globe. Uh, transitions are now zero latency. Um, so for this, what this means is, is we can't wait six months uh, to do a transition. We can't even wait three months. They're often immediate. Uh, and it's really difficult to, uh, to get this concept of constant change uh, happening in a, in a large scale IT environment. Um, we do believe that enterprise IT is going to change massively once this has really started to be understood, this concept of hyper evolution of technology and the movement that we're moving in to constantly, constantly change. Um, DevOps, no ops. Uh, so what, why even ops? Um, my belief, I said earlier, you know, computers should work for me. Um, I don't want to, uh, to work for computers. Um, most computers I know, they're, they're pretty smart. Uh, they can actually do some great things if you tell them what to do. Um, so I, I encourage us to tell those computers to do more um, so we don't even have the concepts of DevOps. How many software developers actually want to do any sort of ops whatsoever? I'd much rather have my software developers just thinking about their code and making the best code possible. Um, so I'd really like to switch the concept of uh, you know, what operations is and, and just remove it from the equation. A retool. Um, so inside of enterprise IT, you know, enterprise IT is a huge market uh, and there's lots of tools in there. Um, they don't all wear sweater vests, and, uh, and a lot of them are actually uh, fairly smart people, um, and it's, it's, it's a huge environment that I think is actually not uh, tapped nearly as enough as it could be uh, for the people that are pushing the envelope. Meaning, uh, you know, concept like pass, there's, there's very few enterprise IT shops I talk to today that are actually embracing platforms of service. Most of them are just getting started on uh, infrastructure as a service. Only a few of them are actually using public cloud today. So the opportunity is, is, is monstrous, um, and it's, uh, you know, it's this big juggernaut that can actually be shifted. Uh, some people say you know, $100 billion uh, worth of spends that, that's available uh, to tap into. Um, and pausing is for the dinosaurs or the Titanic. So, so fundamentally, we don't believe that, uh, I don't believe that you can, uh, you can pause. Uh, we work very aggressively to, to drive this change. Um, it's not an easy change to make, uh, but we do believe uh, that, that all IT shops need to go upon this. So today, I think PASS is 100% relevant to enterprise IT now, um, but it has a, a lot longer way to go. So if we really want PASS to be that platform that enables enterprise IT shops to build Cloudware applications, to move from the traditional legacy onto the new way of, of doing things, uh, we have a, a significant opportunity uh, to do more and more on, on that platform. So with that said, thank you. <laughs>